I think uh, we're going to talk about tonight is something which is, it's a really nice little bit of Torah wisdom that is special because it's not limited to spiritual pursuits. So we talk a lot, we could talk about, okay, how to become a really great Torah scholar, which is great, and I think it's fundamental, crucial, and vital to become a great Jew is to study Torah. But there are other insights that we have in, in Jewish learning and Jewish study that is really applicable. It's like gateway wisdom. It's applicable to many pursuits in our life. Um, what we're going to learn tonight is something that we could use if we want to become great in Torah or great in real estate or great in pharm- pharmacology or really any area or pursuit. Uh, and it's really essentially trying to get to the core of, of the human condition because as humans we strive for greatness you know, in ancient sources, we find that the human is the only kind of mammal that's always standing up because we're striving for greatness. Uh, and that's what we are. And we all have dreams and ambitions, and we have, you know, we have goals that we'd like to do. And it could be, of course, in areas of professional, career, financial, but personal. You, want, you know, you want to lose weight, or you want to, you know, run a mile, or you want to, whatever you want to do, that's the human uh, mindset. Let's let's. We have these big goals, and we have these inspirations, and we, you know, we get motivated to try to change the world, or at least change ourselves, or at least change the neighbor. Which is always easier to change the world, right? You know, they always tell people to change the world because it's easier to change the world than it's to change yourself. The hardest thing to do is change yourself. But that's what we are. We're trying to become great, or at least improve, or at least take on tackle projects and succeed. Uh, and we know some people in life, like you look at them, and it's just, it's just amazing how it's, it's wondersome that some people are like, you know, those go-getters that just do it. And they're constantly doing new stuff and they're following through all the way to the end. And then you have those people every week, they're starting something new, right? Uh, uh, check out this. I, they're starting doing something new this week. And a week later, they drop that and they're on something else. Uh, and the question I want to try to get to the core of is why is it that some people are successful in their big dreams or even their little pursuits or little projects that they make for themselves while others maybe have dreams and maybe have ambitions and have these grandiose plans for what they could do and what could they impart upon the world but ultimately actually never get to the finish line. You know, uh, we have an author in the room. To write a book, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, you have to face resistance every day. You have, you're, you're there, there's a blank page and you have to go. And you have to push yourself. And then, you know what, this, you, you, you hit some writer's block. Well, what happens? Well, some people say, ah, I'll start something else. Let me, let me work on my novel now, or let me work on some other project. And they drop it. And other people are the ones who uh, are the heroes, the ones that push all the way to the finish line and actually see a project to completion. So my question is, what separates the people that are inspired and actually implement their dreams into reality from the people that maybe have dreams and maybe want to change the world or at least change yourself or go on to some big project but don't successfully do that. Uh, and the question is, what separates them and how can we perhaps learn the skills of changing ourselves, changing the world, accomplishing something uh, admirable and great? So uh, I want to look at last week's Parsha. We find uh, a juxtaposition of two entities or you know, one person and one group of people that both were inspired but went in divergent directions. You have on one hand uh, an inspiration that changes a person and makes them not only forfeit a lot but to accept a lot and to become great in some new area of their lives. While on the other hand you see another, this time it's a group of people, who are likewise inspired and in fact are inspired even more Yet, not only do they not become great or change themselves, they actually do things that are questionable. Uh, so in the middle of last week's parish, we read about Yisro. Yisro uh, is Moshe's father-in-law. Uh, he uh, was from Midian. He was a member of the clergy. Now, clergy in yesteryear means a pagan. He was an expert in the divinity of the pagan variety. And we learn about him in Exodus. He hears the stories of the Jewish people. He's inspired. 
and he says, I want to join this nation. And he leaves his family, and he leaves his temple, whatever temple it was. He leaves his stand in the community. He leaves the place where he's comfortable in, gives all that up, and goes to join the Jewish people where he's an outsider. He's a pariah. The Jewish nation, you know, we believe in this one God, and suddenly this guy shows up, and he has a whole litany of idols in his backpack. And he has lots of history with who knows what. And he decides to join anyhow. And he joins, and he gets stature. You know, there's an entire section of the Torah that's called Yisro, because he's a great hero, where he comes up with this clever solution of outsourcing justices, which is interesting, right? You know, he, he wakes up and he sees Moshe with a line like the DMV, right? There's a line waiting out the door, snaking around the block, like a DMV or people waiting to go into one of the rallies of pick your choice, Bernie or Trump, whichever. And he's like, what's going on? And he sees people come to Moshe and they're asking him questions. And Moshe's there all day and night, morning to night, asking questions and answering questions. And Yisro's mind starts to like, wait a minute, I have a better solution. Why don't we outsource some of your questions? You know, make legions of 10,000 and legions of a 10 and 50 and 100 and 1,000. And every group should have its leader and only the most toughest questions get to you. And that's what they actually indeed implemented. So this guy who started off his career as an idolater, as a pagan, as a pagan preacher, is suddenly a hero in the Torah. He comes up with this clever scheme of outsourcing judicial responsibilities. And in fact, the most important event that the Torah describes, in fact, arguably the most important event in all of human history, the Mount Sinai experience, the name of the Parsha is called Yisro. So he actually took the name of a Parsha and named it after Yisro in his honor. So this is someone who was inspired. He heard about what happened to Jewish people, and he changed his life, even if it mean, meant forfeiting his position, and he achieved greatness for eternity. We're talking about him now. Contrast that. The Jewish people. The Jewish people, they were in Egypt, they were enslaved. And then Moses comes along, and he brings with the miracles, and there's ten plagues, death of the firstborn, everyone's wowed, even Pharaoh's wowed, he sends the people out. Seven days later, he surrounds them. What are we going to do? Oh, Yvay, what's going to happen? We're all going to die. <laughs> Splitting of the sea. They run, start running into the sea, and, and they see the Egyptian tormentors behind them. The water crashes upon them. It's a, an incredible experience. They're so inspired. And then they're walking in the desert. They're all fired up. And what happens? They get hungry. Next day, they wake up. There's manna out the door. They pick it up. What's this about? Moshe says, this, this is your new food. New food? Doesn't look like food. They ingest it, and it's this miraculous, magical food that you, in your mind, you think about what you want to eat, and that's what it tastes like. Oh, what a miracle. And then a couple of days later, Moshe tells them, okay, we're, out, we're around this mountain. Everyone get ready. We're going to have a tremendous experience. And then three days later, they experience the Mount Sinai revelation. They get prophecy. They get all, you know, they, 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 they're terrified and they're excited and they're delighted and there's joy and trepidation mixed together. And they tell, God, tell Moshe, tell God to stop talking to us. This is too much. And Moshe speaks to them. What an incredible experience. Just inspiration after inspiration. And then what happens 40 days later? Well, that's, this is Parsha. Four days later, there's a golden calf. Now, the precise details of what happened is a little bit unclear. That's maybe a, a, a separate discussion, what exactly happened. But there's some sort of hint of idolatry, some sort of rejection of God. Wait a minute, didn't you, weren't you just inspired? Why are you going back to your idolatrous ways? What happened over here? You were inspired. Why are you changing? You couldn't change yourself? You couldn't... Hold back from idolatry for 40 days? You're eating man in the morning. How do you not believe? And fast forward to last week's fire show. What happens? They get fed up with the manna. This is only a year and change after the exodus. They're eating manna for, for a year, about a little more than a year. And they say we're sick of it. You know why we're sick? Let me read you why they're sick of it. 
like, who will feed us meat? We remember the fish we ate in Egypt, the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. They had cravings. The manna couldn't taste like. The, the five foods that the manna couldn't taste like. Read them again. Cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. I think we could survive without that, right? But these are the only foods that the manna couldn't taste like, and that's suddenly they have this craving, this desire, and like, oh, this is terrible, let's go back to Egypt. Well, why couldn't it taste like that? So Rashi says the reason why because the, these foods were harmful for pregnant women. Okay. But it, it's it's bizarre. Like they, they 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 it's as if they were looking for areas to complain. Like if I got manna, can you imagine you got manna every day, and twice on Friday, wouldn't that be wonderful? Isn't that convenient? You don't need to worry about cooking. You don't need to worry anything. But if you're a serial complainer, no matter how wonderful things are, you'll find something to complain. And this is this is the first of a laundry list of activities that you wouldn't expect from an inspired nation. In this upcoming Parsha, we're going to read about the spies. So, like, because the Erev Vav? Yeah, so of course. So some of the people with the Erev Vav, the mixed multitude, these were the troublemakers. These were the ones that always were stirring the pot and always giving Moshe a hard time. These were the people that joined just for the party. These were the people that jumped to the bandwagon. And every time things got a little rocky, they started complaining. That's true. But even those people, they should have also been inspired. So yes, mostly it was about the, it was the Erevav, was the mixed multitude, but still. And the Torah, uh, you know, recounts this as a problem with the Jewish nation as a whole. So there's something wrong with experiencing all these miracles and all these causes for inspiration on one hand, yet not displaying in your behavior uh, that you know, re- re- reflecting that inspiration. So my question is, what kind of set Yisro apart from the Jewish people um, where we see again and again rebellion, rejection throughout the Torah? Uh, we were reading a couple of weeks about Korach. Korach was someone who tried to overthrow Moshe and Aaron's leadership. Can you imagine a coup d'etat when Moshe is obviously a prophet, he's a verified prophet? It's unbelievable. So my question is, what exactly is at the core of this divergence? Now, I want to take this a little bit, uh, I want to dial back the clock. Assuming, our question assumed that people get inspired. You know, sometimes if you're by a fiery, fiery lecture of inspiration, you, want, you go to a Tony Robbins event, motivational speaker, Everyone's fired up. But some people are like, in the corner, eh, how was it? It was okay. Eh. And the other people are like, they're making these commitments and they're making these resolutions and they have these plans. So is it possible that this divergence begins a little bit earlier in the process? We ask the question, how is it possible where two people are inspired and one changes and the other one doesn't? Maybe the problem starts even earlier. Is it possible that the person who didn't change wasn't even inspired? How do we actually get inspiration? I'll give you an example. Smokers, do they know it's dangerous? So there's two kinds of smokers. There's the ones who say, I'll, I'll quit, I know it's dangerous, I want to have a good time, give me a couple more years. And then you have those smokers that go visit the doctor. They're 55. They're not feeling so well. They go to the cardiologist. He takes a scan, a chest x-ray, and he shows them what their lungs look like. And then he pulls out another image of healthy, pearly pink lungs. And he says, these are healthy lungs. These are your lungs. If you continue along this path, you're going to be dead in 12 months. The guy walks out, takes his cigarettes, rips them up, puts them down the toilet, never again going to smoke. We know people like that. They find out it's dangerous and they get a vivid Im- image in their head. This is terrible. I, you know, my, what, what, I, I want to be able to walk my daughter down uh, to her wedding canopy and you know, I, I, you know, I want to be, you know, I want to be in my, in my 70s and 80s and be healthy and vibrant. Give it up right away. I'm done. They're inspired, and they change. And then we all know the people who are like, really? 
It's not so dangerous. It's not so unhealthy. What do you mean? I know some guy who was 107 years old when he died. And he smoked three packs of unfiltered cigarettes a day. And in fact, he quit when he was 106, and that's why he died. <laughs> Actually, my dad quit smoking when he was 50. Uh, that's uh, 12 years ago. And he said it was the worst decision ever made. <laughs> Just, he had no health problems till then. And Symphony is not, stop, not stopping not having health, health problems. But we, we know such people. Some people are, and they both, two people go to the same doctor. They uh, encounter the same information, the same cause for inspiration. But one of them gets inspired and changes. The other one deflects the inspiration. They poke holes in the inspiration. They say, well, how reliable is the information? What do you mean? And they point to uh, anomalies, people that live a long life. And smoke. those people are the most dangerous people out there. You know, the uh, the ones that live a long life. Yeah, exactly, because they're like, well, wait a minute. The, Uncle Bob was a smoker, and he was 103. And he ate by the, you should see how much he ate by the barbecues. You know, this fictional Uncle Bob. But my question is, okay, so we see two people, both of them have the same cause for inspiration, yet one gets inspired and the other doesn't. So where does, you know, how does that, how, how does that work? I'll give you another example, guys. Touch thing while driving. Everyone here has a cell phone, a smartphone. Does anyone doesn't have a smartphone in the room? Oh, there we go. Does your phone text? Also not, okay. So this is... It's one step above. <laughs> okay, so basically it's a rotary phone. Okay, but is there anyone in this room who has a smartphone and a driver's license that can say that they have never once texted while driving? No. Nobody? Not a single one. Okay. <laughs> so, now, <laughs> everyone else, does anyone here doubt do we doubt that it's dangerous? Anyone says, well, it's perfectly healthy, perfectly safe, there's no danger. Everyone knows it's dangerous. So are we crazy? Are we crazy that we, we all know it's dangerous? When you see the other guy in the other lane texting, you freak out because they're looking at the phone and not, right? That's, that's terrifying. But somehow we think we could do, we could text, we could watch the road in our peripheral vision. Now that you start texting, like, can you believe what I text? <laughs> Yeah, you know, and Instagram, everything, and it's just I mean, this alone should really cause us to ponder this question. Everyone here, just right now, admitted, and myself included, that we know that the, probably the most dangerous thing you could do while driving is texting. Right? Maybe if you are very drunk, is worse, but it's close. I don't imagine people here drive drunk, but somehow texting, that's fair game. Now, my question is, why? Like, it doesn't, it's, it's illogical. When you see illogical things that are ubiquitous throughout human experience, it really f- demands you ask a question. We all, we all, none of us want to die. We all want to live, yet we all do something that we all recognize is tremendously dangerous and could very easily cause us to get seriously injured or, God forbid, worse. And that really, like, it's a good question. Like, how is it possible? It's humans are supposed to be rational, right? Why would they behave in a way that's so irrational and so, what do you say? Addiction. We're addicted <laughs> to the internet. Just okay. like people are addicted to cigarettes and the Israelites are addicted to, to meat. That's interesting. But, so, you, you, so it, it, I, I think that's a possibility. It's, it's, it's a calculated risk. You really think it's calculated? It's, it's, when, when the guy's text about the guy or girl is about to text, they're like, okay, let me do the math. What are the odds of me getting killed because of this? And how important is it to send this LOL to the person I'm texting? I, don't, I think you might be right, but I don't think it's, that's the only reason. Because it's not like someone's Googling something so important they need to find out right now. Can't wait till they're you know. I, I, have a, I have a theory. Listen to this. Some of you guys agree. I feel like humans have a capacity to deflect reality. There's something that we all know is real, and that is that when you text while, while you drive, it's very dangerous. Yet, we're able to 
justify it by saying, well, it's not so dangerous. Or it's, it's, it's you know, we're not going to think about it. We're just going to send this one. We're, we're justifying. We're, we're exactly following the pattern of the smoker who says, well, it's not really going to happen. To, am I going to die? Everyone else? What do you mean? I'm, I'm, I haven't died in 45 years. What are the odds I'm going to die now? And this is what we do. We, it's maybe not, maybe not so calculated. It's just there's this assumption that it's not going to happen to me. Why do you think they deflect reality? It's because, I think it's because people get comfortable in the... In they're the, terrified of change. And they're terrified of change, or they just, you know, this is the way I am, or... Yeah, exactly. But also, like, they have, like, an immortality complex. Like, you look at a lot of the dangerous behaviors, like smoking, drinking, texting, or driving. I'm sure most of us probably in this room had a smartphone before we had our driver's license. So for us, it's... We've been doing it the whole time, so it's, we're, we're invincible. Like, we're immune. Like, no one else should do it. But do we really think we're invincible, like... You know, if we were just to graph it out on an Excel spreadsheet, are we invincible? No. Because all of us are going to die, right? The question is, hopefully we shouldn't hasten it before, you know, before we're really old and really accomplished. But yeah, I'm saying, but the point is that there's these illogical conclusions that we tacitly make, and it's, it's harmful. But the way I like to put it in these two baskets, there are those that when they learn about something, when they encounter some reason, they do self-application. So, for example, if you see, uh, we had a, a terrible accident uh, about two years ago on West Belfort. We actually drive on West Belfort between Fondren and Hillcroft. There is a tree that is totally denuded of its bark and has this, like, monument this memorial of, like, there's always flowers there, or sometimes there's a teddy bear with a little heart. And it's, it's like, 15 feet into the, uh, into the um, uh, on the grass. Like, there's, there's the curb and the grass and the tree, 15 feet. What happened was is that some guy was texting, and he careened off the road, and he wrapped around the tree, and he died. And there's this living monument to that episode. And I remember when that happened... Uh, like in the community where I live, there were like these emails sent out, look, with pictures of people who were like just aghast at what they saw. And they sent pictures, don't touch and drive, don't touch and drive, don't touch and drive. And that is a cause for inspiration. There's something which is external to us, which we get encountered. And the question is, are we going to say, that happened to him, it could happen to me. Self-application. We take the inspiration home. We make it real to us. Or do we deflect it? We say, well, you know, how many people die? You know, we do this, a million kinds of rationalizations we can make. But a predicate of, or prerequisite of gaining inspiration is allowing yourself the capacity to take what you encounter and apply it inwardly. Because if you are not used to saying, this could happen to me, or this should matter to me, well, it won't matter to you. You'll, 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 your heart, your, your, your internal uh, inspiration monitor or uh, power is not going to be ignited. Now, this is obviously the negative, like we don't want to smoke or text while dry, but even the positive. Who are the people that, let's say, are the business, the entrepreneurs who change the world? Uh, I was... Uh, I was in San Francisco, and it was 11 o'clock at night, and I needed a cab, but there was no cabs. And I was stuck. You know whose speech that is? Nice Jewish boy. Travis Kalanick. Right? He's a nice Jewish boy in San Francisco. He's an entrepreneur, and he didn't have a cab. So what did he do? He started Uber. Now, he was someone who was able to get inspired and take what he encountered and internalize it and make it something that he should do something about. You know, we like to say, well, someone should make an app for this. The people that are inspired say, I should make an app for this. This is relevant to me. In order to be inspired, life is going to present us lots of opportunities to get inspired. It's possible to be inspired every day because we're used to taking what we encounter and reflecting it inwardly. 
You know, I tell my kids this all the time. I say, you know, how wonderful is it that the Almighty gives us a heart that beats 89,000 times a day? Now, we all know we have a heart that beats 89,000 times a day. We know we never put batteries, never to replace the batteries. And what's not like, you know, when you have a, a smoke detector, every three or four years it, it is a shrilly beep. You've got to change the batteries. We never got that in our hearts. It's just the Almighty loves us, and it just gives us this lifeblood that keeps us alive. And it's just wonderful. And that's so inspiring. And that should really cause us to love God and to, to want to do good things and to be grateful for what we have. But that's only if we internalize it. And we say, oh, God, oh yeah, a heart beats 89,000 times a day. Okay, great. What does it mean to me? It makes me inspired. What can I do about that? Can I teach someone about that? Does it mean something to me? Does it resonate with me? Do I maybe say a blessing, thanking the Almighty for the fact that I'm able to go to the bathroom? You could tell us that it's not something we should take for granted, right? Judaism instituted a blessing. Every time you go to the restroom, you say the blessing. What you're saying is that we have a miraculous network of pipes that are able to extract minerals and vitamins and sugars and all these things that our body needs, send it all across the body, take the waste that we don't need, get rid of it. That's unbelievable piping and hardware and software that we have within us. And we're told to say a blessing. If you go to the restroom about six to seven times a day, we're talking about thousands of times a year you're saying the same blessing. And the hope is to get inspired. Stop and think. The Almighty loves me. He's given me so much of this wonderful things that I take for granted. Yeah. The two people saying the same blessing. One guy is saying, wow, this means something to me. This matters. I have to do something about this. I have to at least change my perception or at least have to have a moment of inspiration of appreciative gratitude to God. That's someone who, who's inspired. They went to the bathroom and that means something. That's really nice. And unfortunately, you know, you don't, we only start appreciating things once we don't have them anymore. It's very easy to get inspired once you lose the thing that should have inspired you when you had it. You know, if God forbid, God forbid, we have a heart, you know, people who get, this is tragic, but people get uh, bladder cancer. The bladder is a little bag that holds your urine until it fills up, so you shouldn't have to go to the bathroom all the time. If not for the bladder, we'd be perpetually either in the restroom or we'd have to make diapers or something like that to not be leaking everywhere. Someone gets bladder cancer, so if we can't operate on it and remove it, they have to take out the bladder or fashion a new one. But sometimes they take it out and they have a little pouch, a little pouch. Can you imagine how embarrassing it is? You carry with you a little pouch that is like an artificial bladder that you have to pour out every, every you know, two, three hours. People live like that. Someone like that. Can you imagine the shame of carrying this little urine pouch with you everywhere you go? That person is inspired, but it's too late. He doesn't have it. And I'm sure he's regretting the fact that he didn't, you know, he took it for granted. He was entitled. He didn't value what he had. But how many things do we all have when we don't, we're, we're inspired, we just take it for granted. That's... Yeah, it's self-understood. It doesn't mean anything to me. I shouldn't be joyous and thankful and appreciative because of that. So the tool or the, the skill that we need to learn if we want to get inspired, regardless of if the inspiration is I should write a book about it or I shouldn't text or I should stop smoking or I should build a business or I should become better at my business, is the skill of self-application. Taking whatever I encounter and internalizing it, making it relevant to me in some way or another. The Talmud tells us in the book of Ervin that if we didn't have Torah, we'd study how to be good people from animals. Bizarre, right? Huh? It's a, huh? Well, you, uh, maybe, it's well it's, yeah. <laughs> what does it say? It says you'd study how to be uh, modest from a cat. Now, some people like cats. Some people have cats as pets. Only someone who's inspired is someone who's always looking to see what can I learn? 
what's relevant to me will get to learn modesty. What is, what's modest about a cat? They don't hide when they do that. Too. That's exactly right. You'll never catch a cat going to the restroom. Never. Not because they don't function like all other animals. They do. It's just that the Almighty implanted within their DNA this this gene of modesty. And what it says is that it gives a list of all these different animals and what we would learn from them. But all that is all predicated upon self-application. Because you could see a million cats in your life and not become modest at all because you're not applying what you encounter to yourself. Once you start applying what you encounter to yourself, you're inspired almost every day of your life. Every time you go to the restroom, you're inspired. Every time you eat, you're inspired. Every time you wake up in the morning healthy without any brain aneurysms that killed you, you're happy and inspired and delightful and joyous. And What a life is that? Isn't that a wonderful life? Where you're always learning, you're always improving, you're always avoiding things that are harmful and appreciating the things that you have. One little switch to start, well, it's not so little, but it's one skill that you acquire to tr- it's, it's the inspiration still, self-application. The question number two is, once you're inspired, what do you do, what do, you do about that? Is it possible that the Jews at Sinai were inspired? They did self-apply, yet that didn't work. So that's really step two. But step one is, you have to learn to get inspiration. You get inspiration, then it's important to learn how to seize it, that it doesn't go for naught. Because inspiration doesn't last. Inspiration is like, uh, back to those smartphones, you have to play a smartphone game, and you get like a power surge, that you can run faster in Temple Run, you run faster, like, you can run faster for like 30 seconds, but you see on the side this bar that delineates how much time you have left for this power search. Right? That's what inspiration is like. You got it, you will lose it. The human capacity for deflection cannot be underestimated. Even at, if you want your inspiration to mean anything, you have to find a way to take that inspiration and translate that into something that will last, something that will, you know, will will be with you, you know, over the long term. How do you do that? It's the same question, right? I, I think, you know, this is really a question about life, right? How do we maximize life? Or at least, how do we become great people? You know, so I think any part of this step of these steps are critical. Like if if you guys walk out over here and say the rabbi taught us how to get inspired I'm going to try to do something about it. I'm, or I'm going to get inspired about it. You got people listening to the same lecture and one person's like, oh, that makes sense, that's interesting, that's not interesting, that, oh, I, I don't know if I would say it like that. And the other person's like, wow, this is inspiring. Well, what can I do about it? Like, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same self-application quality that takes something that potentially can be inspiring and makes it internally resonating within you and you know, a potential impetus for change in life. Rabbi Akiva. Everyone here knows the story of Rabbi Akiva? Yeah? Anybody not know of Rabbi? Everyone, everyone heard of Rabbi Tiba. But anyone knows the story of Rabbi Tiba and the Rock? Everyone familiar with that story? I'll, I'll tell it briefly. Rabbi Tiba began his life, like we all do, as a total ignoramus in Torah. But he maintained it for 40 years. At the age of 40, Rabbi Tiba was inspired to start studying Torah. Now, the Talmud tells us the story of his inspiration. He was a shepherd, like a lot of great Jewish leaders, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and David. Rabbi Kiva was a shepherd, and he went with his flock 
to the well. At the well, he saw something very unusual. He saw a rock, a large rock, that had a very, um, you know, very um, cylindrical hole in it, like an un- unusual hole. And he asked the people around him, why does this rock have this neat little hole going through it? I said, well, don't you see? There's, there's water that is dripping from the stream directly on that spot in the rock. And over the course of thousands of years, that water, even though water is very soft, but so much water over such a prolonged period of time, at specifically the same point, it acts, eventually bore a hole through the rock. Says Rabbi Akiva, if water, which is soft, can penetrate the rock, which is hard, Torah, which is hard, can certainly penetrate my heart, which is soft. Committed to go to yeshiva. Went to yeshiva, and of course the rest is history, became the greatest rabbi and teacher of his time. Just a few questions here. Question number one is, if you actually look at Jewish history, Rabbi Kiva was someone who was a vital link of Torah teaching. If he didn't exist, we wouldn't exist. And there's this one rock somewhere in Israel that kick-started his campaign to Jewish greatness. Why don't we take that rock, put it in a museum? Why don't we know where it is? Like, why is this rock not a bigger deal in Jewish life today? Do we not know where it is? Did anyone even try to find it? That's question number one. But question number two, Rabbi Kiva was inspired to become great because of this rock. Everyone else also saw the same rock in the same hole, and where are they? They didn't make the connection. They didn't apply to themselves. Something as, you know, as, as inorganic as a, a rock with a hole in it, which to us would be like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, how cool is that? Take a picture of it. Instagram it. That's what we would do. It is very cool, right? Rabbi Kiva had the quality of self-application. So he took this and said, I'm actually going to find some way that's meaningful to me. And he said, well, wait a minute. Maybe this is telling me something. This is telling me that, you know, something, even something soft can penetrate something which is hard. So certainly something which is hard can penetrate my heart, which is soft. All the other people saw the same rock, but they weren't applying what they saw to themselves, and thus they weren't getting inspired. And you know what? This rock really isn't so important because Rabbi Kiva was inspired by this rock, but it's very likely that if he wasn't inspired by this rock, he would have been inspired by something else. Rabbi Kiva was someone who was wont to get inspired because he had this quality of self-application. Once you self-apply, you'll find inspiration wherever you turn. That's a good question. So it's possible that he only got the quality of inspiration at that time. That's a good question. But maybe he was inspired by other things. We know, I'll give you guys the story of Rabbi Kiva to just show that he was a remarkable person, even though he was ignorant. Um, the Talmud tells a story of him that when he was still uh, in his ignoramus stage, he was working for someone for three years. Working for him for three years. And then the three years, he says, okay, I'm going to go back to my family. Why don't you pay me all the money you owe me? So the guy was a very wealthy guy he was working for. He says, sorry, I don't have any cash with me. You don't have any cash? What do you mean? You want the rich? No, he didn't say it. Okay, well, you know what? Don't worry about it. Give me uh, livestock. Give me animals. I'll take animals instead. I don't have any animals. You don't have any animals? Okay, fine. What about, uh, like, uh, uh, textiles? Give me sheets. Give me linen. Give me, give me, give me that. No, not, none of that. Exhaust, give me fruits and vegetables and food I could sell. None of that. Dejected, can you imagine? Walking away from three years of labor, your boss says, I'm sorry, I can't pay you. When the guy is living in opulence, he's in a big house, he has servants and a fancy car. Rabbi Kiva goes home back to his, Rabbi Kiva was sold then just a Kiva, goes back to his family. And a few weeks later, the guy shows up. And the guy shows up, and he's got, uh, he's got his money, plus he has delicacies. And one system. 
what were you thinking when I told you I don't have any cash? He says, well, I was thinking that maybe you donated your money to charity. <clears throat> oh, when I said I didn't have any fruits and vegetables, what were you thinking then? Well, I thought maybe you didn't tithe it, and when it's untied, you can't give it away. And what about, uh, and everything, like, everything that he said, he's like, well, I thought maybe this, I thought maybe that. Rabbi Kiva, even when he was ignorant, he still was judging everyone favorably. So he was a remarkable fellow, he just wasn't a Torah scholar. One more quick story. A couple weeks ago in the parasha, we read about the Sota. The Sota is an adulterous woman, or suspected adulterous woman. And uh, if a woman is suspected of being adulterous, she could, if she admits and says, yeah, I sinned, they get divorced, and nothing happens. The Torah describes what happens to her when she's a suspected adulteress, but she claims innocence. So then it describes this process where they bring it to Jerusalem, and they say, well, will you admit what you did or not? Either way, they bring her here, they give her a special drink to drink, and that drink is a magic potion. If she sinned, it would do terrible things to her, and if not, it would do wonderful things to her. And the Talmud says... If someone happens to be privy to a sota investigation in the temple, they should become a nazir. What's a nazir? A nazir is someone who abstains from wine, from coming into contact with dead people, and from cutting their hair or shaving for a minimum of 30 days. What in the name of God, does the connection between these two things. It's like, if you see a sota, if you see a suspected adulterous woman being investigated in the temple, you should become a nazir. What do the things have to do with each other? Explains the Talmud. When you see someone who may have committed acts of immorality, who may be promiscuous and be cheating and having affairs, what you're taught, what you're told, is that you have to self-apply. You have to say, whoa, 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 that could happen to me. You see someone who texted and drove and died, you have to say that that could happen to me. You see someone who may have committed adultery or did in the case that she did, you have to point your finger inwardly and say, this could also happen to me. I'm not going to drink Wine, which brings to levity, which brings to immorality, for a little bit of time. Clearly we see that when you see something externally, you're supposed to internalize it because that is a lesson or a point of inspiration that could help you. So we're inspired. What do we do about it? Better yet, let's look at someone who didn't get inspired. This is a great story. There was this cab driver. And the cab driver in, in Israel, Israel's, Israel has a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. The biggest problem, the biggest problem the country faces is that the only people that don't run the country are driving cabs. It's just this complete misalignment of skills. Every cab driver like, has those solutions for everything. So there's this one cab driver uh, who told a story, a secular cab driver, you know, Israeli cab drivers, you would know this, Yuval, they have, if you go like into Israeli cab drivers, like, they live in their cab. They have all these little trinkets and these pictures of family and all these stuff dangling everywhere. So this guy walks into the cab and they start talking and he's like, oh, let me tell you a story. What's the story? It was in the Lebanon War of 1982 and all young Israelis go to the army. My dad was, my dad's Israeli. He was in the army for four years. Now it's only three years. But he was with his group of comrades, of friends, and they were in the middle of uh, Shmirah. They were doing their patrolling. One guy was up and watching, and the rest of them were sleeping in bed or in the tent or whatever. And in the middle of the night, they all wake up and they hear their friends screaming. They go outside, it's all super secular, 
they go outside and they see their friend is being asphyxiated by a boa constrictor. Massive snake is totally wrapped. He's turning blue. They don't know what to do. They try to grab their guns, and it's it's not it's not happening. He's tightening, 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 and they tell him, as Jews are taught from the very earliest age, Tagid Shema Israel, say Shema Israel. You want you? How do you die? You die as a Jew. Shema Israel. He screams Shema Israel. Hashem al Kesham He screams Shema Israel. Miracle of all miracles. The snake unfurls itself, detangles, and slithers away. They give him some of the drink, they rehabilitate him, he's fine, he's shaken up. And the cab driver finishes, this guy was inspired, he went back to civilian life, he started investigating his heritage, he became more involved, he joined the synagogue, he became more observant, he became Shomer Shabbat, he changed, he was inspired, and he changed. So the guy in the cab says, well, wait a minute, slow down. You saw this also, right? So how come you didn't change? How come you're the same guy the way you were before? Your friend, well, what's the difference? He says, well, that happened to him. Uh. <laughs> and then it's, it's true. Like, it's something happens to someone else. It's meaningful for them. It's not meaningful for us. But it's, that's illogical. So, I mean, something happens. Internalize it. You internalize it. You could change. Now, but this is the critical point. Let's transition to point number two. You're inspired. You have to realize that your inspiration is, the second you're inspired, that's the peak of your inspiration. It's, it's all downhill from there. So if you want to take that inspiration and implement it into a meaningful change in your life, you have to act immediately. You have to seize it while it's hot. You have to grasp it. You cannot let it linger. Because if you say, oh, I'm inspired now. I'll do something when I get home. You get home. You have to, you know, you're, you're tired. You got to take a shower. I'll take care of it tomorrow. And it never happens. So if you're inspired and you actually want to change, whatever it is, you commit right away. God forbid, if you're privy to an accident and you know the guy was texting and driving, if you, and you, you're shaking, it's, you know, it's terrible, terrifying to see in front of your eyes an accident happening and you know the guy's dead. There's no way the guy, there's no way he survived. You're, you're shaking up and you, you know, you're inspired. This could happen to me. It's just, that was right in front of me. Look, look, oh, it's just a bunch of mangled metal now. If you want to make sure you'll never touch the gun in your life, you have to do something right now. As you're there, as the emergency vehicles are converging, you're right there, do something now. And you have to be clever. You have to be clever and say, if you just say, I commit to never touch things, I don't know if, that, if that's good enough. Because then, well, tomorrow it's a little bit less. Right? What I would suggest or I would propose, if you want to make sure that you never text and drive again, you say it like this, you say it out loud, you announce it to whoever's there, you post it on your Facebook. If I ever text while I'm driving again, I'm going to impose a mandatory fine of $300 on myself, or $100, or whatever it is, or $500. If you do that, you'll never text again in your life. That, that'll become your thing. And it's cheap also. It's a cheap way to stay alive. That's just an example of how you can make sure that it won't happen again. But the point is, is that whatever you do, whatever you decide, or you could say, I'm going to go and speak to 20 people and tell 20 people what I saw and help them maybe not text and drive. Right? Whatever it is you want to do to implement this inspiration, you have to decide now. Or you have to accept upon yourself an act of commitment now. If you do that, it'll have a life of its own. It'll maintain and perpetuate this change within you. If you don't, if you say, okay, I'm inspired, and you let the inspiration be the only thing you come away with, that'll be gone by tomorrow, maybe not tomorrow, maybe the following week, but it's for sure going to be gone. If you want to 
concretize it, if you want to ensure perpetuity in your, in your, in your inspiration, do something now that's going to last from now on. And there's a, uh, an amazing story in the Talmud, back to the Nazir, right? So the Nazir was something that the rabbis shunned. They didn't like when people became a Nazir. You know, the Torah gives us enough restrictions. We don't need to make more restrictions upon us. So when someone says, I'm going to withhold and abstain from wine for 30 days and not going to come in contact with that, like, oh, the rabbis were very unhappy about it. But the Talmud tells of a fellow by the name of Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Atzatik, that he announced, he says, I never was happy with a Nazir besides for one. There was once a young man with long, flowy locks who came to the temple and he said, I'm a Nazir who completed my Nazir service, uh, uh, my, my Nazir period. And when a Nazir is finished their 30 days, they go to the temple, they bring a sacrifice, and they cut off all their hair. So the rabbi says, this guy with the nice, beautiful mane of hair, and he says to him, why do you become a Nazir? And he tells him, he says, oh, well, I was a shepherd, back to the shepherds, and I was tending to the flock out, they were grazing, and I happened to have passed a spring of water, and I saw my reflection in the water, and I realized how beautiful and handsome it was, and suddenly I got this urge to go to town and start committing sins, and I was inspired to change. And I said, I'm going to become a Nazir. And a Nazir, at the end of, end of the 30 days, has to go to the temple, bring a sacrifice, cut their hair. And therefore, I'll cut the hair and I won't have this urge to sin. That's the end of the story. And the rabbi sees him and says, gives him a kiss on his forehead and says, Yarbu kamotcha Israel. May there be more of you, of like you in Israel. There's a few questions. First of all, if the entire lesson of the Talmud is that there was this one guy who did the right thing and became a Nazir just to cut off their hair, to remove the urges to sin that they had with their hair, we don't need to tell the whole story. He came with this. He was a, he was a shepherd. He saw his reflection. Just say that uh, the details, the extraneous details, number one, Number two, if you are inspired to cut off your hair, what should you do? Take a scissors, cut your hair off, and you're done. Or if you like it to be a little bit more manicured, go to a barber, let them cut off your hair, and you're done. The most convoluted way to cut your hair off is to accept upon yourself the oath of a Nazir, to spend 30 days not drinking wine and not coming in contact with that people, not cut, and not cutting your hair, and afterwards you go to the temple, you be a sacrifice, and then you cut your hair. It's the most circuitous path to a haircut I've ever heard of in my life. Why would this guy think that the best way to cut your hair is to become a Nazir? And the answer is that he recognized you're inspired there's a shelf life to that inspiration. If you want to do anything about it, you have to do something now. But he's out in the fields. He's tending to the flock. He doesn't have any scissors with him. What's the one thing he could do now that will guarantee that he'll have to cut off his hair? Becoming a Nazir. He can accept on himself, behold, I accept on myself, I am a Nazir for 30 days, and he knows for sure he's going to have to cut off his hair. But... Had he waited to get back to your house, you settle down, you remember, oh, I need to do something, cut my hair. Well, you're not so inspired. Maybe I'll wait till tomorrow, and it'll never happen. I think that uh, the key points here are as follows. We are going to be encountered in our lives with causes for inspiration. That is universal. Do you know why? Because you go to the bathroom, that's a reason to be inspired. That alone can inspire us to change our lives. However, not all of us will be inspired. Maybe all of us will, but not all of us collectively as a species 
are going to get inspired because some of us are not going to internalize it. Not for me. Deflect it. What, what, what should I do about it? They're the ones who almost died, or they're the ones. They're, they're the ones who were the bad drivers and got into the accident, or only those people are the smokers who die. Whatever it is, right? let someone else fix that problem that society has. Let someone else write that book. The people who get inspired will say, "No, no, no. this is my calling. I'm going to do something about that." You're inspired. Act upon it right away. You act upon it right away, and there's a chance. And of course, once you act upon it, there's still going to be resistance. You'll have to be, have to, you'll face adversity. You'll have to power your way through through the obstacles that lie in the path of anyone who wants to do something really admirable, really altering to themselves, or certainly to society, to others, change the world. Certainly, but that's the beginning of any transformation. I have one more quick story, a little bit of a personal story. Um, if, 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 you, if you need to go, you could go. Don't worry about it. Um, thank you all for coming. But I want to tell a story about my, uh, my grandfather in, uh, during the Holocaust. Don't worry about it. See you all next time. Thank you, Yuval. So my grandfather was from Germany. He was in yeshiva in Poland. He got to yeshiva in 1934, at the age of 20. And in 1938, with the rising rhetoric of Hitler, all German nationals were kicked out of Poland, including people that were 1,000% innocent, like my grandfather, was told, you have to leave Poland and your visa is not being extended. Now, could you imagine the plight, at least certainly looking back in history, someone who is faced with, you know, being kicked out of Poland, only place to go is Germany, and it's 1938. That's not a good place to be, right? Well, eventually he managed to get another extension of his visa three months later, but ultimately he had to go. It was the end of 1938. The war was looming, and he was stuck without a place to go. And miraculously... The same week where he had to leave, he received a letter from a family in Stockholm, in Sweden. And in the letter they said, we are one of the only uh, Torah-inspired families in town. There's no one here to teach our children. Would you like to come here to be their teacher? The Almighty threw him a lifeline. He went to Sweden. In Sweden, he was there for, throughout the war, from 1938 to 1946. And he survived, obviously, but it was also uh, vital to many of the efforts to save Jews in Europe, in the Inferno. For example, he managed to secure hundreds of passports and visas for students that were trapped in what was then was the eastern part of Poland, which was occupied by the Soviets. He managed to save, you know, with, along with other people, hundreds of yeshiva students who managed to crisscross all of Russia to get to safety in Shanghai and in Japan. But the entire, entirety of the war, he was trying to help as many as people as he can. In 1945, the war was over. The fighting ended, and the rebuilding began. You have thousands, really millions of survivors at camps, in displaced people's camps, people with terrible illnesses and diseases, and weighing 68 pounds just on the doorstep of death. And they're trying to find families, and they're trying to find relatives. It's just a chaotic world. 1945, we think of the fighting being over, but really the rebuilding was painful as well. Now, the Swedish government had a problem. Their problem was that they had a lot of young, eligible men and not so many young, eligible women. So they told the Allies that we will accept 20,000 Jewish women as refugees. Let them come here between the certain ages, young women, 
and then they'll become Swedish. They'll learn Swedish, and we'll, we'll get, give, get them all the help they need, and integrate them in society, and they'll all marry in and be lost to the Jewish people forever. My grandfather's in Stockholm one day, and he reads in the, in the newspaper a, a story that there's a few trainloads of refugees that arrived from Europe. And he said, well, maybe, maybe I could go help. Maybe there's some Jew, who knows. Like, who? So he makes the, tra- the trip. He gets to the camp, enormous camp. Just as far as I can see, there's uh, displaced people, and he's walking around trying to figure out. It turns out they're all Jewish, all Jewish women, and he's taken by the sight. And as he's trying to you know, gather his thoughts, he hears a bell ring. The bell ring, what's the bell ring? He asks someone, says, well, this, it's lunchtime now. Lunchtime. Okay, lunchtime. So he says, well, I brought lunch as well. And he starts asking the girls, does anyone know where I could find a place to wash my hands? Why does the man want to wash his hands? Okay, they sit between him. He goes to wash his hands. He finds a place to wash his hands. And he's making the blessing that we've only thought to die him. And he turns around and he sees all the girls are gathered around him. They're all crying. These were all, you know, the best girls from the best Jewish families that spent four or five years in camps. They didn't see a blessing. They didn't pray. And then they see this rabbi with a bit beard who's praying. So they saying, Tati, Tati. They remember their families. And they all start crying. My grandfather starts crying. He sees all these Jewish girls that are here, middle of nowhere, in Sweden of all places. And they're just here, bereft of any, anything. Young girls, 16-year-old girls, 18-year-old girls, broken in heart and spirit, in body and spirit. And here they are, after the war, with no one or nothing, all their family, all their cousins, the parents, everyone's gone. And they're alone in the world. Obviously, it's very emotional for everyone involved. And he is heading in a train back, and trying to figure out what he could do. And, you know. and then he says that he was inspired. On the train, he says, the only way to help these girls that they don't get totally lost in the Jewish people forever is if you build a school. Well, build a, build a school and give them Jewish education. Get them back in the fold. He said he was inspired... And he decided right then and there he's going to do whatever he can to build a school for these girls. He got off the train before his stop. He sent a telegram back to Stockholm to all the people that he was involved with in trying to help as many Jews as he could. We're meeting tonight. Urgent. That night, they met. And they told him what he saw. Everyone's obviously shaken up. What do we do? Everyone agreed the best to do is to open a school. To open a school, easier said than done, right? You need money, you need facilities, you need a venue. They told my grandfather, you find a building to host this school, we'll take care of everything else. How do you find a building? What do you do? Where do you start? My grandfather decided to write a letter to the Ministry of Interior, explaining the situation, young Jewish girls, we want to open a Jewish school for them. See what happens, right? You have nothing to lose. He said he was certain, certain, that this was for naught. Well, you got to try it, right? Shockingly, he gets a letter back. The, the letter says, how many buildings do you need? Mm-hmm. And like that, a school was born. In the ashes of Europe, in the ashes of the lives of so many millions in a little island right off of Stockholm, a place called Lidingo, L-I-D-I-N-G-O, they opened a school. They had hundreds of girls. And they had instructors who were a little bit older who remembered some of the Jewish education. They had some of the local people, like the rabbi and, and his wife, were there. And it was remarkable. They were able to inspire the girls to you know, enliven their lives, to reconnect them back to their heritage, 
to teach them again how to read Hebrew. You know, and, and these girls today, they would have been, who knows what would have happened to them. They would have been lost to the Jewish people. And over the course of that, school was open for, I think, two, and three year, two to three years. And those women, they went on to the United States. They built wonderful families. And I, I, I was doing the calculation recently. Who knows if there's not, if there's not maybe 10,000 descendants of those, of those original girls who would not have been around if not for someone just being inspired and saying, I'm going to do something about it. Well, what are you going to do, right? What are you going to do? Well, we'll figure out what we're going to do. So I have a picture here. I should pass it around. My grandfather was single at the time. Uh, so he wasn't even there on campus. He would come in once a week to give a, sh- to give a class, to give a lecture on the Parsha, on the weekly Parsha. Uh, yeah, pass it around. It's the picture. You see, he's, there's a picture that we found uh, from the archives of him teaching. It's an unbelievable picture. He's just sitting there with a bunch of girls and teaching them about the Torah. 1946, something like that. And just on a personal note, my grandmother, she should live and be well, she was one of the instructors in the school. So that's how they actually met uh, indirectly. They didn't actually get married till 1947 when they got to Israel. No, she's from she was from a regular family. She was from one of the famous rabbinic families in Europe, and she herself writes in her book that when she got out of the camps after four years of hell and brutality, she didn't remember how to say Ashrei. The most basic prayer she couldn't remember how to say. But what, you know, it's, it's hard for us to imagine what kind of upheaval these people went through. And then one man was inspired to do something about it. He had a cause for inspiration. He internalized, I'm going to do something. Me? What can I do about it? I don't know anything about schools. I don't know anything about getting buildings. I'm going to do something. We'll try. And the second he was determined to do something, he gets off the train. Let's see what we could do. You know, and, and who's to say? Like, he even start earlier. He reads in a newspaper. By the way, he was reading it in Swedish. My grandfather was a remarkable man who actually wrote a book in Swedish. Wrote books in at least, I think, four languages. To write a book on its own is something remarkable. But He reads in the newspaper that there's a trains with refugees. Maybe there's some Jews I can help. Maybe there's people who are forlorn, I have nobody to turn to. Well, maybe I can help. Goes there. Maybe I can open a school. All sun letters. I don't know. We'll figure it out. And he changed the world. Think about that. Who's to say that there's not a hundred or ten thousand Jewish children today that have strong Jewish backgrounds because their great grandmother was saved from being lost to the people because of one man's inspiration. And by the way, that goes on. And in in two generations, that 10,000 may be 100,000. It's exponential. It's unbelievable. And I think, arguably, I'm saying, I'm around here. My grandmother's still around. She's in her 90s. Uh, my grandfather passed away at the age of uh, almost 91. But think about what kind of legacy you could carve out for yourself. What kind of legacy is that? To do something to save thousands of of Jews, but if you save one person, you save one person, you save the whole world. And there's other people, I'm sure, read the same newspaper article. Well, I feel bad for the refugees. Oh, I feel, what can I do to help? Just uh, call me if you need anything, those kind of people. And it's, it's unfortunate where people, you know, don't know the lessons of taking things, I'm going to do something bad. Uh, what, what can I do about it? I don't know. I'll try. We'll, we'll see what, what happens. And my hope is that, you know, if, if we're inspired right now, we could walk out the door and say, wow, that was, that was inspiring. That was really lovely. Or when we're inspired, we say, what can I do about this? How do I internalize this? Right now, I, you know, I'm not trying to make anyone comfortable here, but that, that's what we could do. Next time I see somebody that needs help, 
I'm going to jump on it. Maybe you could say that. You know, how many times, you know, certainly the older we get, the more established we get, we'll see people that'll say, uh, hey, um, see this kid, he needs a job. And you can help him. So when we get that, we're like, I don't have any jobs available. Oh, maybe I'll ask someone if they have a job available. But who's to say you're not right now at the point in this child's life that if they get back on track, they'll be productive and they'll a, a job and a mentor could help them change their life or change the direction of their life. They'll go to school and get a family and be productive. And who knows if, they, if they're just teetering and maybe they could just, maybe this is the critical juncture of that child's life. And if it was your child, you'd be up the whole night trying to help them. It's the Almighty's child, we shouldn't do something about it. But I think this awareness of being ready to jump on opportunities to be ready to be inspired and to seize them and to do something and to do something and to do something, it's a very valuable skill. And yes, of course, it's valuable in the spiritual realms of our life. I think it's very valuable in areas of our life that are not at all related to our Judaism. It's our career, our professional life. It's, it's a really a, it's a gateway quality. Uh, this is what separates the people that ach- accomplish great things that we hope that we could be like and, uh, and everyone else. So my hope is that everyone, um, li- let's, let's be inspired every day. Let's live, live inspired and become great people and try to change the world. Thank you all. Look forward to next time. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming.